Let us pray. God of prayer, some of us come to you daily. Some come to you only when we are in need. And others rarely reach out for your guidance. Reveal to us today the power that is ours for the taking in prayerful living as we pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth might be pleasing and acceptable to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a very, 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 very extremely difficult scripture for me. Especially what's going on in our world today. But Paul says in our, in our epistle lesson that we heard that prayers should be quiet, <clears throat> quiet prayers. And in fact, he identifies prayer as the main activity of the Christian community. The main activity we are to have is prayer. Private prayer. Quiet prayer. We are to communicate with our God often because that brings about a strong relationship with God as I explained was talking with children about. Obviously, you, if you don't communicate with somebody, how can you have a really good relationship with them? Does anybody here have a really good relationship with someone they've never talked to in their life? Kind of hard, isn't it? Yeah, kind of hard to have a relationship with somebody you never talked to. But when you communicate with them, when you talk to them, you build a strong bond, you build a strong relationship. And when we pray, it's exactly what we do with God. We bond and we forge a strong relationship because we communicate on a regular basis. And then Paul really throws, throws me under the bus or throws a lot of us under the bus when he said we even have to pray for our government and those in authority. Because authority was ordained by God. So even if we don't agree, we still have to pray for our government, for those who are in authority. Now, the hope is, is that your prayers for those in authority will lead to a quiet, peaceful, and dignified life for you as a Christian. And you have to remember where Paul's coming from, because remember Paul, what was, who was Paul's name? What was Paul's name before he became converted? Saul. Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee who went out and collected Christians and drug them back to Jerusalem to be crucified or thrown in prison. So Saul, of course, gets, has the, the light flash on the road to Damascus, and Jesus asks, why are you persecuting me? Christians were being persecuted this time, and Paul is encouraging these Christians to pray for the government, to pray for the emperors, to pray for the Roman authorities, to pray for the centurions, to pray for the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders of their day who were, in fact, persecuting them. Now, that's in complete contrast to what Jesus taught about social upheaval. I mean, Jesus was a rabble-rouser. He let, the, as, as, the, as one, uh, one centurion said, he let the old, the, uh, the old gray beards really have it. He criticized the Pharisees and the scribes. Matthew 12, 33-35. Jesus speaks to the Pharisees saying, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers. How can you speak good things when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person brings good things out of the good treasure, and the evil person brings evil out of the evil treasure. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the authority of his day. In Matthew 23, 27 through 28, again, Jesus speaks to the religious authorities of his day, saying, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and of all kinds of filth. So you also, on the outside, look righteous to others, but inside 
you are full of hypocrisy and lawfulness. Luke 12, 37, where Jesus speaks the reversal of the master's authority. Blessed are those slaves who the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten the, his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. Paul and Jesus aren't exactly on the same page, are they? No, Paul wants a nice quiet prayer, and Jesus is out there telling the Pharisees exactly where to go. <laughs> Man, it doesn't sound a very peaceful and respectful uh, authority uh, of Jesus' day, does it? Well, while Paul touts the benefits of prayer and respect for one's government, Jesus warns of authority gone bad that needs to be called out, but we also need to trust that God, that God will take care of those who abuse their authority. We just need to do what? We just need to pray to God for proper and righteous authority ordained by God to prevail. And Paul confirms Jesus' teaching by reminding us that God is one. He is one for the whole world. God is one. The one true God for everyone. And even when we think the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, we can trust in God to do what is right in God's time, not always in ours. This was the warning to the fledgling Christian community of Paul's day to beware. Don't get caught up in secular problems of the society. Do what is lawful to do. Pay your taxes, serve in the military if you have to, and respect, and respect authority. That's what Paul was telling this Christian, this fledgling Christian community. So they kept themselves safe and out of alignment and out of the, out of the eye of the Roman guards and out of the eye of the Pharisees and scribes. And you did this so that you could focus more on God and not on the world. Paul goes on to explain that Jesus is the ultimate mediator between us and God. And even though in Paul's day the Roman empires often considered themselves gods, and often Christians had to pay homage to them, but when we have Christ as our mediator, we are forgiven. And we can stand upright and righteous before God, resulting in a right relationship between us and our maker. Here is where Paul and many theologians don't agree totally. Paul claims that a ransom was paid by Christ. Humanity was kidnapped by Satan by Adam's original sin. So that humanity is now sinful. <coughs> this is the backbone of substitutionary atonement theory. And we've talked about that in the past. This is where the, our sins are put on Christ and judged, resulting in our sins being forgiven. It's what the church has always considered the way we are forgiven. Substitutionary atonement. And while most <coughs> most uh, Theologians agree that God gave humanity free will, and that free will has become a major problem for humanity. Not all of them believe that this is the only way, the only way to atonement or forgiveness of sin. But almost all of them agree that right relationship with authority is extremely important. Relationship with God's authority and with secular authority. Otherwise, we'd be violating God's ordination of authority in this world. So we're kind of between a rock and a hard place, aren't we? Yeah. We may not agree with all the rules and regulations and ordinances and parking tickets and parking fines and all the different stuff that goes on at the national level and the federal level and, and the state level and all this stuff. We may not agree with all that. But God ordained it. God ordained it. But how are we to deal with this authority that has gone awry? We know how Jesus did, don't we? But how, how do we stop dictators, autocrats, or authoritarians when they hurt God's people or God's creation? Paul suggests that the quality of our prayer life has an enormous 
an enormous impact on the outer world. Our prayers mean something. Our prayers can actually be the solution. Our prayers for a quiet, peaceful, dignified life can actually make it so. So that leaves us, a major, leaves us with a major decision to make. Can we sit here, we can either sit here and complain about our leaders and our state leaders and national leaders and even our church leaders until we're blue in the face. But the ultimate way for us to impact our life and our world around us is through our prayers. And there's a story about a man who didn't even know how to pray that might help you. A man's daughter had asked a local pastor to come and pray with her father. When the pastor arrived, he found the man lying in bed with his head propped up in two pillows, with one two pillows, and an empty chair beside his bed. The priest assumed that the old fellow had been informed of his visit. I guess you're expecting me, he said. No. Who are you? Well, I'm the new associate at the local church, the pastor replied. When I saw the empty chair, I just figured that you knew I was coming, I was coming to show up. We're going to, be, going to be showing up. He goes, oh yeah, the chair said the bedridden bed man. Would you mind closing the door? The puzzled pastor shut the door. I've never told him this to anyone, not even my daughter, said the man. But all my life, I've never known how to pray. At church, I used to hear the pastor talk about prayer, but it was always went right over my head. I abandoned any attempt at prayer, the old man continued. Until one day, about four years ago, my best friend said to me, Joe, prayer is just a simple matter of having a conversation with Jesus. Here's what I suggest. Sit down on a chair, place an empty chair in front of you, and in faith, see Jesus on that chair. <clears throat> it's not spooky because he promised, I'll be with you always. Then just speak to him and listen in the same way you're doing with me right now. So I tried it. And I liked it so much that I do it about a couple hours every day. I'm careful, though. If my daughter saw me talking to an empty chair, she'd either, she'd either have a nervous breakdown or send me off to the funny farm. <laughs> the pastor was so deeply moved by the story and encouraged the old guy to continue on his journey. Then he prayed with him and returned to the church. Two nights later, the daughter called to tell the pastor that her dad had died that afternoon. Did he seem to die in peace, she asked. Yes. When I left the house around 2 o'clock, he called me over to his bedside, told me one of his corny jokes, and kissed me on the cheek. When I got back from the store an hour later, I found him dead. But there was something strange. In fact, it was beyond strange. It was actually kind of weird. Apparently, just before Daddy died, he leaned over and rested his head on the chair beside the bed. May we all use prayer as a serious spiritual discipline to bring about God's kingdom in our midst and change the world at the same time.